Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, three. City, city, sibilance, sibilance. Levels check, good, sounds good. One, two, three, rolling and... We're here, we're in this business to help protect people's livelihood. And the biggest asset to anybody who's a filmmaker, the equipment that you're working with. Without that, I mean, people, they can't operate. It's a huge investment, you know, like people, they they spend a lot of money on their equipment. So you definitely want to make sure that if anything happens to it, that investment doesn't just go down the drain. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life. This is a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I'm your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 122. And it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of Documentary Film, The Documentary Life Podcast, and The Documentary Life Monthly Workshops. Your opportunity to join a group of doc filmmakers such as yourself for two and a half hours and engage in a workshop led by yours, Truly. To see the full roster of this month's workshops, go to the documentarylife.com slash workshops. I mentioned to you in our last episode that I had just returned to Cambodia after filming a job on the west coast of the U.S. for the past three weeks. It's a job that I've been doing every year for nearly a decade, and it rarely deviates from year to year. The client knows me well, and I know the job well. I'm usually filming in a number of cities packed into a very short time frame, and then I spend the rest of the time editing videos from what I shot. At this point, I've been doing this job so many years that the client has long entrusted me to produce the entire video series on my own. This means that I'm traveling with all of my gear, filming and conducting interviews in each location. I do the lighting, filming, sound, conduct the interviews, and then I edit the videos afterwards. Initially, I would go out with the client, and he or she would at least conduct the interviews. But now I produce these entirely on my own. I spent a lot of time in airports, even more so this year because I was coming from halfway around the world, right? I had to fly from Cambodia to Portland, Oregon in the U.S. before the job even began. And then I was shooting within 14 hours of landing in the U.S. And within two more days was back on flights, embarking on what I like to call the annual whirlwind tour for this particular client. As you can imagine, I've developed a system for this kind of one-person crew gig over the years. And for me... It all starts with the travel preparation and implementation, especially on gigs where I'm shooting in multiple cities in just a few short days. So for today's opening segment, I thought maybe I'd start off with five tips for solo filmmaking travel. So let's get right into it. Number one, book smart flights, not cheap flights. Now, I understand the temptation to find the cheapest flights out there, you know, in order to minimize the costs of travel on your job. I'd also say be careful with this because saving a few dollars on your flights, it can hurt you before you've even begun your first shoot. You don't want to save some dollars by spending inordinate amounts of time in transit on your flights. Time is money, right? And the more time that you spend in airports, the less time you have on the ground preparing for the job at hand. And oftentimes, you end up spending money anyhow in airports, whether on meals or snacks or whatever. It's better to get to your destination sooner so that you can get settled into your hotel, get some rest, and get prepared for the upcoming shoot. Of course, you also don't want to book your flights in a way that the transit time is maybe too short. I did this, unfortunately, coming back to Cambodia. And this meant that when I arrived to Siem Reap, Cambodia, after nearly 23 hours of total travel, my bags were sadly still in San Francisco. 
the city that my first leg flew to. There was such little time to make my connection in SFO that I was scrambling to train to another terminal, go through security again, and then board my plane, that my bags never even made it onto that flight. If you're flying internationally, you should probably give yourself about two hours, but no more than three hours between connections. Domestically, you'll probably be fine with an hour. Number two, fly with your camera. Bigger film productions will often have to pack all of their film gear into like these big Pelican cases, check in at the counter and, and hope for the best on the other end. Whenever I'm working on a bigger commercial shoot, when none of the gear is mine, but I have to pack and send to the location, this sort of thing kind of petrifies me. Admittedly, I'm a little neurotic this way, but you know, I've been on a shoot where things got dicey because half of the gear didn't make it to the other end. Depending on where your location is, this can be a nightmare. On a shoot to El Salvador, none of our tripods and personal bags made it with us. Not only did I have to wear the same clothes for three days in humid El Salvador, but we had to sweat out not having our tripods until the very day of the shoot. Much time was taken up on international calls to United Airlines and then getting the tripods through customs once they'd actually arrived in country. Now, I always bring my camera with me. I fly with a great carry-on case. It's a camera bag made by Think Tank. My camera, batteries, and two lenses fit nicely into this case. Nine times out of ten, the case fits perfectly into the overhead. And on the few times that it doesn't fit in the overhead, I take the camera out and I do a gate check. In fact, I'll put a link to this case in the show notes for this episode. Actually, you might check out a post that I wrote last year called Essential Travel Doc Filmmaking Gear List. This is a nice resource for essential gear to travel with. Number three, pack some sustenance and vitamin C. You never know how much time you'll have between flights or between shoots, so it's a good idea to pack some kind of something in your hand luggage. Even almonds or cashew nuts or a cliff bar, they can be a lifesaver when you're hungry but don't have the time to grab a meal. Also, pack some vitamin C and or electrolytes with you. Airborne, right? The company Airborne has obviously become a favorite for those traveling by air. The idea here is to keep hydrated, something that isn't always thought of when we're traveling to and fro and to fend off any nasty colds or bugs that are known to creep around airports and airplanes. Number four, pack a change of clothing. I learned this one the hard way. Again, it was in sweaty, sunny El Salvador, where bags and tripods didn't make it until day three. My poor roommate, bless him, had to endure my work clothes being the same as my after-work clothes. But hey, at least there was a shower, right? It's always a good idea to pack at least a change in underwear, socks, and a t-shirt in your carry-on. You know, right next to your 70 by 200 millimeter lens. It'll fit right in that think tank, I promise. And lastly, number five, taxi or ride share. It used to be whenever I traveled by plane, the first thing I'd do upon arrival to a city would be to rent a vehicle to get me to and fro the hotel, the airport, shoot locations, and such. Nowadays, this actually seems like a waste of time and money when you can simply grab a taxi or use one of the rideshare services that are out there, i.e. Uber or Lyft. Think of the time saved if you don't have to get to the car rental service. Stop for petrol on the way out and the way back. Drive the car back to rental before your flight out. Why not just take a taxi or rideshare to your hotel and location and save the hassle, time, and money it takes to rent a car? Unless you'll be traveling to multiple locations, you might even end up saving money by the time the rental, insurance, and petrol costs are all added up. So those are five tips for solo filmmaking travel. Pretty simple ones, maybe, but I'll bet some of those can be very helpful, especially when you're doing the solo filmmaking thing. If you'd like to see this written out, you can simply go to the show notes for this episode by heading over to our website at thedocumentarylife.com. And I'll also post a link to the Essential Travel Doc Filmmaking Gear Less blog entry that I mentioned earlier. It's actually a pretty good addition to this episode. You'll find the Think Tank bag that I use, as well as some other gear that might be appropriate for your solo doc filmmaking adventures. All right, thanks for tuning into our second episode of Season 3 of TDL. Our industry guest conversation is just on the other side of the break, here on The Documentary Life.
Over the past couple of months, we've been receiving emails. We've been active on the TDL Community Facebook group, and we've been having one-on-one -on -one conversations with you. And I'm happy to say that once again, Doc Lifer, we have heard you. Earlier this month, we gave our first live workshop. It was the Going Solo With Your Documentary Filmmaking Workshop. The response was overwhelming. It seems that we touched a chord with some of you, but I'm not surprised. So many of us doc filmmakers are doing the solo doc filmmaking thing these days or are about to attempt it for the first time. And anyone who's done the solo doc filmmaking thing knows that it is not an endeavor that should be taken lightly. If you haven't done it yet, it will probably be one of, if not the most challenging things that you'll ever do in your life. But it can also be one of the most gratifying, life-altering journeys of your life as well. Which is why I run this workshop. I can help you transform this deeply challenging journey into the kind of life-shifting experience that it deserves to be. And I can do this when we again run the Going Solo With Your Documentary Filmmaking Workshop, which is on Monday, February 17th, where you will participate in a live interactive environment with other solo doc filmmakers like yourself. And this event, of course, will be led by yours truly, someone who, let's just say, knows a thing or two about the solo doc filmmaking thing. We will delve into the world of making your documentary film with little to no crew. I'll discuss advantages and disadvantages of going it solo. We'll go through an essential gear list and a night before the shoot checklist that I put together to make your going solo a bit more streamlined and efficient so that you can concentrate on what matters most, making your best documentary film. In this workshop, I will transform your shooting, your interviewing, and your sound abilities. And I will help you better understand your funding options as a solo doc filmmaker. And I will help you become and stay more connected to a doc filmmaking community so that you can feel less isolated and alone in your solo doc filmmaking ventures. If going solo with your documentary filmmaking is something you've been wanting to do or simply get much better at, you can register today by going to thedocumentarylife.com slash workshops. If you're a one-person crew, this is the doc filmmaking course that will seriously alter not only your approach in doc filmmaking, but also the way in which people will experience your doc films. Don't lose your seat. I've won the earmarked just for you. But this workshop filled up quickly the last time out, and I'm anticipating more of the same. So I would not wait. Secure your spot today in the Going Solo with your Documentary Filmmaking Workshop at thedocumentarylife.com slash workshops. Become your best solo doc filmmaker today at thedocumentarylife.com slash workshops. Over the years here on the Documentary Life, whether in the community Facebook group or here in the program, we might touch on it occasionally, but this is the first opportunity to meet directly with people who run an insurance services, which covers a number of policies that are directly related to people who work in the film and TV industry. And so I wanted to bring on a company called Athos, who are operating out of the Los Angeles area in the U.S., and I wanted to have a conversation with them today and hopefully get some answers to some of these questions that I've been coming across. So first of all, let me welcome you both, Catherine and Eileen, to the program here on The Documentary Life. We're glad to have you on the show today. Thank Hi. you for having us. Thank you so much. Now, Kat, you created this concept uh, called instant insurance. What is this and how does it apply to the film industry? Yeah, so essentially what it is, is it's it's basically the ability for someone who can just go on the website and, you know, it's equipment insurance. So it's pretty simple. You know, there's a value, there's your number of days. So it's very rateable, right? It's very easy to rate. And so um, it just allows the customer to be able to quote and then instantly purchase the policy. And then after they purchase the policy, our system just generates all the documents and emails it to them instantly, mm. which it actually Athos has to have a lot of authority, you know, by the insurance carrier to do this. Not every insurance brokerage can do that. So we have like a, you know, a very, you know, high authority with the insurance carrier. We're kind of like underwriting arms of the insurance carrier and we're able to issue policies on behalf of them. 
And that's why we're able to create this website. And then the cool part about it is that after you buy it, you can also manage your policy online. You can issue certificates online, especially for those rental houses, you know, if you have rental coverage on there. Um, so it's just it's just been amazing, you know, because a lot of people like that. But at the same time, yes, it's instant and it's online. We also pick up the phone, right? Because yeah. there's tons of online companies out there. And if you need help, it's like, OK, you know, you can only reach them by, you know, possibly an email or search for the answer yourself. And so we're kind of offering both, you know, because we want to give clients the choice to choose what kind of service that they want. And so, yeah, we have lots of people who come in the door or not the door, but through the Web um, and they basically we never talk to them. And then there's some who call and they have tons of questions and we're happy to answer those. So that's really what it is. It's giving the. um filmmakers, the producers, the camera operators, you know, kind of the ability to buy it. So they're not waiting, um, you know, for someone, um, you know, especially they're probably shooting, you know, during the work hours. Right. And so that's why we see policies coming in at 3 a.m. Yeah, I'll bet. You know, 5 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. Now, we have a lot of independent doc filmmakers as listeners and and by nature, a lot of the independent doc filmmaking crowd may not have a lot in the way of finances, if you will. And and they're probably asking themselves, why should I be using gear insurance? This seems like an unnecessary luxury. What would you say to them? I mean, I think for us, we've kind of seen the worst of it, right? Mm. We've seen people come to us and say, oh my gosh, I... I just suffered a loss. You know, someone broke into my car and took all of my gear. Yeah. And this is my livelihood. Um, you know, I've learned my lesson. Can I buy insurance? Yeah. And so I, I think for us, that's really what it is, is we're here. We're in this business to help protect people's livelihood. Mm. And and the biggest asset to anybody who's a filmmaker um, obviously, you know, your talent, right? But also the equipment that you're working with. Without that, I mean, people, they can't operate. Their businesses, uh, they're at a standstill. And we've seen that over and over and over again. Or, you know, they're coming to us after having an insurance policy that maybe didn't protect them the way they thought it would. There are these hidden exclusions that all of a sudden, you know, once you have a claim, now you're seeing the policy and someone's pointing out, oh, actually, water damage isn't covered. Isn't covered, right. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then you're kind of like, uh, OK, but I'm an underwater filmmaker. How does that work? Yeah, right. You've seen yeah, that, yeah. too. And it's terrible. So I guess for us, like the answer is if if you value your time and your your business, um, definitely ensure your equipment, because that's part of, you know, a, a huge part of your business. Yeah. And just to add to that, too, it's it's a huge investment, right. you know, like people, they they spend a lot of money on their equipment. Right. So you want to protect that investment as well. Right. Because, you you know, you saved up all that money to buy it. So you definitely want to make sure that if anything happens to it, that investment doesn't just go down the drain. It was a no brainer for me, but it took a while to kind of get to that point. Uh, it, it was really <laughs> when I started investing in more robust gear, it, it just started to make sense. I mean, even something as simple as a laptop. Like, look, if you're if you're if you're right. a creative and you have a two thousand dollar Mac, you want to be able to have that covered if you're going to work. And 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 right. it started from there. And then you're adding cameras and you're adding sound and lighting gear. And and for me, a lot of the a lot of the commercial and doc work that I do tends to take me overseas. And I mm -hmm. just I just felt I started to feel uncomfortable not being covered. Now, it's interesting right. because mm -hmm. early on before I could before I could truly find sort of gear insurance in the way that you guys uh, operate, I was, you know, doing it. I was just getting myself covered through, you know, renter's insurance or when, you know, mm -hmm. we owned the house, I would get it covered through there. And it, it, mm. it, it, and it never it, it never failed to uh, surprise me how when I would try to get this a, a gear sort of insured in that fashion, it was always a little bit of a challenge 
understandably so. It mm-hmm. wasn't their expertise. And so when I mm-hmm. when I when I did find someone like yourselves, and so, so actually somebody had recommended you guys, and that's how I found mm-hmm. Athos myself. And it, it was so straightforward. It was so apparent from the get go that this is what you specialized in was the entertainment right. industry. And and I get Steph and I both get asked all the time if we can recommend insurance coverage for for gear and and for. Um, this type of insurance. And uh, it's, it's, it's easy to be able to, to, uh, and I'm not here selling you guys at all. It's just easy to be able to, to (laughs) recommend you guys, because this is what you do, as opposed to finding this, you know, circular way around finding somebody who can find a way through another party to be able to cover you. So it's very straightforward. Mm -hmm. And and I appreciate that from from the get go. Now, the other aspect that I really appreciated, and and it's what sold me, uh, another part that really sold me is uh, the couple that had recommended me, they're also uh, owners of of a, of a boutique production house, and they recommended you because they they actually had good experiences with you uh, that started with a bad experience, and um, and they mm-hmm. had had some uh, some gear stolen, and and mm-hmm. they basically described how it was very straightforward, and working with you guys helped them kind of recoup some of the costs on that pretty, pretty in short order. Uh, maybe you can okay. share a little bit about that. Um, what the process is when somebody has insurance coverage from you guys, what is the process of making a claim? How does that work? Yeah. Um, so it's simple. We try to streamline it as much as possible. You essentially can call us or email us and say, Hey, something happened to my gear. It's been stolen or, you know, I dropped it, whatever it may be. And we'll essentially, or I will, I'm actually the one that's in charge of the claims that goes through here. Um, I'll send you literally like a one page claim form. Again, we try to make it as simple as possible for everybody. Mm -hmm. And it has just very simple things, you know, when, what exactly took place? When did it take place? Those types of questions. You send that back to to me, I'll review it. And then we essentially submit it on your behalf to the insurance carrier. Mm. We take care of submitting copies of your policies. Um, Obviously, if if it's a theft, there's a police report that's usually required. If you have a copy of that, we will take it, we will submit it for you. Um, And essentially, we're in charge of pushing it through to the insurance carrier to make sure that there is a claims adjuster that's assigned to you. But that's kind of not where it ends, because a lot of times, you know, brokers are just like, okay, here, take it to the carrier, The, the carrier will take care of it. But for us, like, we know that our clients essentially you know, depend on this insurance for their livelihood again. Yeah. And so we want to make sure that not only is there a claims adjuster assigned to you, but that they're actually working with you throughout the process up until you get your claim paid. Mm -hmm. That's the important part, right? Just to make sure that we're managing it. We're helping clarify questions. If they're waiting for you, sometimes there's things that are lost in translation. So we'll, we'll hop in and and step in and say, Hey, did you need anything else? Like, can we, you know, what else is there that we need to do? Can we, when can we expect this payment to be made? Um, so we really help with that process. And we've, we've found that that's actually been part of uh, why it's been successful. And we've gotten a lot of really good feedback mm. in the way that we approach claims that way. So mm-hmm. let's back up a little bit and talk about, mm-hmm. help us understand the difference between, say, like set and set and crew coverage and sort of individual gear insurance coverage. And what I mean by that for listeners of the program uh, I'm talking about, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, people reaching out to you at three or five in the morning because they have a shoot the next day. So there is there is a difference between sort of coverage on a shoot, per se, versus having general gear insurance coverage. Can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, so that's a really great question. And it's good to kind of distinguish the yeah. differences. Um, so basically, gear insurance, right, is going to cover the theft or accidental damages of the actual equipment itself, right? It also can cover if you, you know, are renting equipment, right, you have to have a very specific coverage for the renting of equipment. Mm. Um, and This is why a lot of these rental houses want to make sure you have very specific language on the certificate of insurance, Mm. because if you just have like a general, you know, what we call a business owner's package policy written with another insurance company that's not familiar with this industry, it's not going to cover the equipment in that way. Mm. Um, And so that's why it's very specific. So that's the equipment insurance part of it. Um, 
And then what we call general liability insurance, that's going to cover third party bodily injury. Mm. Um, and what that is, is so a third party is someone who's not your cast or crew member, right? So a lot of times people think, oh, liability, it's covering everybody. And it's not, it's, it's anybody who's not part of the cast or crew. Yeah. And like one example, for instance, is if let's say you're shooting a film at, let's say a museum, right? And then your sets, you know, your set is set up, the people are walking by in your cast and crew. But mm. what if there's a museum director who happens to be there and she trips over a wire, yeah. okay, that you guys maybe set up and, and hits her head, right? This is actually a, a true claim that just ha that mm. happened. So, um, so that would actually be the general liability because she's not part of the cast or the crew, but she got injured because of something that was a result of what you guys were doing. Mm. So that's, that's that part. And then um, oftentimes what we need to include in the coverage is something called third party property damage, right? And in insurance policies for entertainment, oftentimes they exclude that from the general liability coverage right, and you have to right. add it back on, okay? <laughs> Which is very, a lot of people don't, get that, especially if you don't, if you don't do a lot of entertainment insurance, you, you know, it's, it's not very standard to do that. So you always have to make sure that this third party property damage is, is added in. Yeah. And what that covers is if you actually damage the space that you rented, yeah. like the walls, the floors, you know, whatever, just, you know, it's, it's very important that that's added. Cause that's actually going to be more of the claims that we see, to be honest, yeah. is that. And so, um, it's really important that that's added in there. So those are the main production things. There's also like, you know, if you're renting a grip truck, you know, or, or a vehicle or an auto picture car, then you need to get the auto insurance, which right. is the auto liability and the physical damage. Okay. So the liability is going to cover if, you know, someone's driving that auto, they hit someone on the road and now your production company gets sued. Yeah. That's the liability part. The physical damage is, you know, you drove the auto, you rented into a wall and then now you need to pay for the, yeah. the vehicle. Yeah. So those are honestly the main <laughs> coverages i would say in mm -hmm. in production insurance well i'll i'll share something with the two of you that i have not shared with many people at all in my life and certainly uh not openly with my listeners <laughs> your story rings it rings a few bells many years ago when i was working uh when i was first working in the industry as a pa as a production assistant and i was working with a major commercial company and I was driving a, uh, driving a 110 art department truck, and sure enough, I backed into somebody's somebody's car in the middle of the like five o'clock and, and during you know five o'clock rush hour in, in downtown, and completely wrecked their car. Completely wrecked their car, and uh, yeah, I just hit a blind spot, right? And so you know me as a PA, and I'm freaking out, blah blah blah. But I'm thinking, of course, well, it, it, at least at least this will be taken care of because of course a major commercial uh, production house would have uh, would have substantial coverage and then i would find out from the produ I, I saw how much the producer was freaking out and uh, and then I, and then i heard <laughs> later on that they weren't covered for this and that blew my mind. Oh. I couldn't imagine Gosh. how they had not covered themselves for this instance. Uh, you know, not surprisingly, I never received a call from them again to work for them. But uh, <laughs> I did hear that they ended up <laughs> making it uh, policy to make sure they were covered for that on every shoot afterwards. <laughs> I hope so. It's yeah, an expensive hope, lesson. Yeah. Expensive <laughs> lesson. That's <laughs> <Too bad>. right. <laughs> Now, oh boy! I know, amazing, right? So, so one of the things that was important for me when I looked for coverage uh, on my gear was, uh, I think I mentioned early on in the program that a lot of my work tends to be overseas, and often that was an issue for me to get that covered. Now I know that you guys do this, so maybe you can help my listeners understand what that process is and what that looks like. How are we covered for our gear once we leave our country? Okay, that's a great question. So our policy, the program that we have that's available online, it's actually it includes worldwide coverage. Mm. Um, so that's why, you know, you actually are you're insured through us. So even if you're not in the US, um, essentially the policy that you purchase, the coverage follows the gear. So it's it's actually what we refer to as an inland marine policy. Okay. It's just an old 
insurance term that essentially evolved over time to now mean coverage for movable or transportable equipment. So in your situation, it would be the equipment that your, you know, your camera, your things like that uh, for production use. So that's essentially what an inland marine policy is. Now, I do have to say that as in all insurance carriers, we are bound by um, essentially the U.S. Department of Treasury's list of uh, countries that are sanctioned by the U.S., ah, right. which means that if you travel to any of these places, you know, like North Korea, or that's essentially hard to get to without some sort of clearance, um, you we essentially can't cover your gear there. Mm. So that, there is that exception. And then for us, too, there is a, a maximum limit of 25000 in the country of Mexico. But we can still cover it. Oh, and right. Obviously, if you need more than 25000 we can always get approval from the carrier. Mm. But it, there's just that maximum that's included. So, so, yeah, you're covered worldwide, which is great. Yeah, we've actually had... You know, we when there's a person who is going to one of those like hot spots, yeah. they can actually contact us and we can actually get them approved. Okay. Uh, most of the time, it's okay. just it's just not like an immediate automatic thing. Right. Yeah. It's it not immediate online. It requires I, conversation and one on one and special. Right. Right. I'll bet. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. And we <clears throat> we will also require for some sort of documentation, like sometimes, especially for people that are working um, on documentaries, maybe in places that are really hard to get to. Yeah. Usually you have some sort of clearance, um, either from the U.S. government or somewhere that allows for you to be in that country. Uh, so if right. you can show that, then the insurance carrier can approve you mm -hmm. makes it for coverage. That makes total sense. And that's going to be the case for a mm -hmm. number of our listeners. So that's great. I'm glad you brought that up. Right. So one of the things yeah. that we did was we posted on our community Facebook group that we would be talking to you guys and if anybody had any questions to let us know. And one of the th one of the uh, first comments was that <laughs> somebody wanted to hear some stories and they wanted to know what like what's give us an, a, a big disaster story that you've had to deal with uh, in terms of the film and TV industry Ooh, covering gear or, or theft or, or what may be the case. Can you give us a, a story or two? Hmm. Oh, gosh, there's so many. No, I'm sure there is. So many, like, <laughs> I'm sure. Crazy stories. Yeah. yeah I mean, the, you know, theft, I think, has definitely uh, has been on the rise. So we've mm. actually been um, covering a lot of uh, gear that's either been someone just like took off with their gear. So we have a lot of people that um, have coverage for their own equipment and they also rent out to other people. Yeah. And sometimes when you rent out to other people, you know, you may not know who those individuals are. Yeah. You may not know them very well and they, you know, take off with your gear. So that's happened a lot. Um, there's definitely been a rise in that. And so for Athos, what we've done is we've actually helped and not a lot of um, brokers do this, but we help kind of help the rental houses and the owners vet these clients. Yeah. Um, and so that's helped them out a lot. I don't know what mm -hmm. other. Clients? Yeah. And with that there. So we have a, a coverage on our form um, that you can add for that. So it's called voluntary parting coverage. OK. And that's basically covering, you know, fraudulent renters. Yeah. So yeah. it's really nice because usually you can only buy that if you are full on rental house. Completely. And, you know, you want to oh, yeah. pay like five thousand dollars for <laughs> like a, a, a little rental house policy. But for ours, it's just our equipment floor. You tack it on. And it's really great for people who especially are now starting to list their equipment on, you know, these marketplaces online, you know, like the community groups, um, you know, the peer to peer rental companies. Right. So that's, grid, that's actually a lot like of what we've been share grid. Exactly. Right. Yep. That's our that's our partner right there. OK. Yeah. So. Um, so, yeah. And I, the thing is, is that um, it's been really it's been really difficult, I would say, because the theft and the fraudulent guys, they're yeah. just getting smarter and yeah. smarter. Yeah. So we're always having to evolve too, because we're trying to protect our clients, you know, you guys, but we're also trying to protect our partners, right? Like our rental house partners too. So, um, that's, I, I would say, yeah, that's like some of the crazier stories we've seen is just the level of fraud mm. that goes into this stuff. Well, I'm um, curious, and, like what, what is the know. level of that that you see if with with actual with people who actually have, dare I say, insurance through you guys? Are you coming across cases where they're actually making up stories that their gear has been stolen and then they're submitting claims? Is that happening? 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah that's too, definitely yeah. happened. We've seen, we've seen, um, you know, oh, I, I, you know, I actually left my equipment in the taxi cab. Yeah, <laughs> and they drove off. Yeah, and there's like no license plate number, no nothing, no receipt, no nothing, and yeah. it's. It's so, you know, it gets really difficult. We've actually seen that claim come in a few times. Uh So on our end, um, for now, we've actually put in a lot of AI technology into our website um, to kind of protect our program as well, to kind of ward off like those types of people. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, when people are buying our our policies online, there is an identification, verification, you know, process that they have to go through. So that's the only way you can really try to prevent this stuff is to to get it on the front end. Right. 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 And also our, you know, our claims adjusters are are kind of also very savvy and and they have a lot of resources as well. So Mm -hmm. we take claims very seriously. Right. So we always say, hey, we're not in the business of denying claims. If you have a valid claim, it is our job to make sure you get paid for that claim. Mm. And the insurance policy's job, essentially, what that's what it's there for, is to make you whole again, right? Mm. That's essentially what an insurance policy is. Mm. However, there's always going to be these people that are kind of gaming the system, right? We have, like, for example, I'll never forget this one claim where this guy was like, he basically said he was shooting somewhere above like a bridge And then his camera fell over the bridge. Mm. And since there was water running underneath the bridge, it like took his camera. Right. Right. So that was the claim. Right. So then we're like, okay, that, okay, that's plausible. Sure. Okay. So where was this bridge? Like, when did this happen? Yeah. And then it comes, comes to a realization that during the time of the year of this bridge, there's actually no running water, or if there was, it's like a foot, you know, of water. Oh. So he very easily could have gone down, retrieved the camera. Maybe it's broken. You know, we can definitely cover that. You know, we've seen that before. Wow. Cameras get dropped. This all is the like time. forensic files, guys. Yes, <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, our investigators, our adjusters are like, this doesn't add up. I mean, he's saying it's this bridge, yeah. like. There's this person he's shooting. Suppose it's like a photography shoot. We can't get a hold of this random person he's supposed to be like taking photos of. Yeah. I mean, it just was so fishy, very you know. Fishy. So yeah, very <laughs> there are ways for us to essentially, hopefully, prevent some of these uh, fraudulent claims from going through. Yeah, so. right. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> now, yeah. what are some what are some common misconceptions or mistakes that independent filmmakers are making when they look for insurance? Ooh, that's a good one. Okay. So I'll give you a couple. Yeah. Um, so what happens a lot of times is the people will under insure themselves. Okay. Yeah, 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 and yeah. think that, Oh, I'm going to save some money because, you know, my maximum exposure when I go out is only, you know, it's only 10,000 yeah. or something. I only bring my camera out you know, 10,000 worth. So they only get a policy for 10,000. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you have these fires in California, wipe out their whole house and they have 60 grand of equipment in there. That's production gear. Mm -hmm. So it's just not a good idea to, you know, to underinsure yourself. And that's, that's where a lot of people get into a lot of trouble, right. Is when they do that. Um, And so I think another one that is really important, um, I don't know if this is a misconception, it's more of like a tip, but it's like any time you're conducting any kind of work, right, or rental, um, you know, you're going out on a job, make sure that you have a contract, Mm -hmm. okay, that legitimizes what just happened. Because There's just some people that are like, oh, yeah, you're my buddy. Okay, let me give you my equipment to use for the weekend. Okay. And then something happens to it and then they submit the claim and we're like, where's the rental contract? Ugh, right. Yeah, right. And there's just nothing to show for, you know, it could be a handshake agreement, but that doesn't work anymore. Mm. Right. Not in our day and age. So it's like we need to legitimize these things. Or even if, you know, you're renting equipment from a rental house, make sure that the name on the rental contract you sign yeah. is the same as your insurance policy, mm. because when they don't match, it's going to really, you know mess up the claims because there's just no, it doesn't tie it to anything. Right. And so, um, that's, that's some of the misconceptions I think, or not misconceptions, but just people aren't careful or thinking about these things yeah. until a claim happens. Until, right? right. And that's right. where it gets really messy. Yeah. 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 Any other mm-hmm. misconceptions you can think of? <laughs> um, yeah, I think one of, 
one big one is, you know, when people call us, they're just like, well, yeah, I have a policy. Everything's covered. Everything is covered. Mm. And it's like, <laughs> okay, well, what, what do you mean by everything is covered? And you really have to read. I mean, I, we get it. Uh, an insurance policy, it could be hundreds of pages long, right? Mm. No one's going to read that. But if you're not going to read it, ask your broker, ask your agent to explain some of the common exclusions that are on the policy because you just never know right tell them hey i you know i work overseas a lot is this going to cover me outside of the country tell them okay i'm an underwater filmmaker is this gonna this coverage gonna include coverage for underwater you know water damage for example so you have to ask those questions um one that i think recently that came up is um a common exclusion is actually when uh governments like seize your equipment like at the airport that that's like government seizure yeah. mm-hmm. so that's actually a very typical exclusion on a policy oh. so if you've seen you know you you obviously travel a lot so um one tip that i i would definitely recommend is is to hand carry some of your equipment so it's not in your luggage because sometimes depending on what country you're flying into you know they can look into your luggage open it and if something looks fishy or it looks like it could be a weapon they can actually take that right and your insurance is not going to cover that Mm. it's called government seizure and it's literally an exclusion on a lot of policies that's great to know actually yeah i I was not Mm -hmm. aware of that and that would be something that i would come up against that's great Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now that's different from if, let's say, the airline lost your equipment. That's covered. Okay. We we've covered many of that. Um, But definitely. Yeah, that that is a good one. And okay, so now I actually I wanted to bring up another one is a lot of people think that insurance covers equipment malfunction. Right. Or like, oh, wear and tear. Oh, it just broke for no reason Mm -hmm. at all. And we're like, ooh, that's not good because – so insurance is going to cover accidental damages. Yeah, right. It doesn't right? cover normal um, wear and tear, know. yeah. Right. It's not going to cover that the, the, the camera just got old, right? That's going to happen eventually. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes, you know, what happens is, you know, the sensor is broken and there's just no rhyme or reason, right? That's actually a manufacturer's issue, right? It has to be covered by the warranty or extended warranties. And and that's actually why a lot of times, you know, a lot of gear is not eligible mm. for warranty anymore because it's just not something that these manufacturers can really guarantee anymore. Yeah. And so insurance is not going to cover that either. It's going to cover, you know, if it's an accident, all right, an unexpected thing that happens, yeah. right, by external force. That's like You're the big You're up on key. top of a bridge and you drop your camera into the water. And yeah. <laughs> as long yeah. as that's a real thing <laughs> <laughs> and not a manufactured story. Right. So that that is a big one. Yeah. Um, I think that's the one that actually most people don't know yeah. is not covered. Yeah. Um, and it's unfortunate. So we, we disclose it everywhere on our website. You know, we, we make it like a, a box they have to check off because oh, we don't want them to think that they're getting that. Now, if people reading, that's another question. You know, that's another issue. Right? That's right. You people can't don't like force to people to read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But so, yeah, what else? I mean, I think those are the main uh, yeah. ones. Okay, great. So Kat and Eileen, if anybody has any questions and they wanted to reach out to you guys, if they had questions after listening to this, whether or not they'd be covered or how claims worked, what's the best way to get a hold of you guys? Yeah, well, anyone, you know, can definitely give us a call or email us. Um, I mean, I can, you know, maybe give that information to you or if you can share that with the listeners. Right. And Um, I can share it in the show notes for this episode. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, we are. We're very responsive. We don't let anything sit in our inbox yeah. for more than, you know, maybe an hour because we're at lunch or okay. something. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we try we try not to let anything sit. And, you know, obviously we're not, you know, open at night and <laughs> we're, yes. we have regular business hours. <laughs> uh, how do we get to Athos? What's the website? Yeah, so it's just Athos, A-T-H-O-S, and then the word insurance, all spelled out, dot okay. com. Kat and Eileen, thank you so much for taking the time to come onto the program. I feel like this was an important conversation that we've needed to have for a while here on the program. And so I'm happy to have had that. So thank you so much for being in the documentary life, Kat and Eileen. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, this is great. We're really glad to share any of our advice and knowledge with all the listeners. Great. Thank you. 
Don't forget, if you like our show and you want to transform your documentary filmmaking this year, we'd love to have you join us in one of our workshops. Check out our current roster by going to thedocumentarylife.com slash workshops. See you next time, Doc Lifer. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.